stories don't define you, how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker of Elkins Consulting. Many of my listeners and clients reach out to me because they're in a major transition. Their children are soon leaving home. They're realizing they want more from their work. They're hitting a big number birthday soon. What they have in common is an underlying dissatisfaction in their lives. Some have identified what that is and others haven't. Some are actively looking for answers and others feel guilt and shame over feeling dissatisfied in the first place. They think, oh, I shouldn't feel this way because I'm so fortunate to have healthy kids, a supportive spouse, a good job, a roof over my head. I shouldn't feel this way because others are in much worse condition. But that satisfaction isn't going away unless they make changes. As a matter of fact, it will get worse and wreak havoc on their relationships. In this series, you'll hear me ask my guests questions to dig deeply into the stories that shaped their lives, stories that uncover patterns and unveil insights into that rumbling dissatisfaction, and also where their strengths lie, where they found and continue to find joy. These stories will resonate with you and you'll nod your head in understanding, and then we'll dig into lessons from those situations, developing clarity about how those experiences shaped them and continue to play roles in their lives. This podcast's intention is to have listeners think of their own related stories and how they tell them, discovering internal messages that are limiting their success, and how to shift their stories so they become positive life lessons to move them forward. If you're curious about what it would be like to work with me, schedule a free private discovery session by visiting my website, elkinsconsulting.com. I look forward to hearing from you. I have been smiling all day knowing that I was going to have this conversation with my friend Suzanne Simonetti at two o'clock mountain time. And um, our dear friend Meg Nosro introduced us and we had a great conversation a couple weeks ago to discuss whether Suzanne would be interested and a great guest on my podcast. And here she is. So obviously that conversation went very well. Suzanne, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Well, um, one of the things that just completely lights me up about this conversation is that I finished your book, uh, The Sound of Wings, Mm -hmm. and thought that it was um, insightful and thoughtful, and it had a couple of interesting page turners in there that caught me a little off guard because it didn't start out as a mystery but there is a mystery in the book. So I, I'm excited to talk to you about those characters and about the, the themes. Wonderful. Anyway, so I'm excited. Ooh, but before we get started, I would love to ask you um, to share something about yourself that most people don't know about you. And the reason I do this is that I love for our listeners to get a little context about who you are before we dive into personal stories. So what do you think? Okay, so, well... I think that um, one of the things about me is I've changed careers a few times. Um, I, you know, I wasn't one of those people you hear people talk about being writers and, you know, that they were kicking around and eating Cheerios and wrote their first story on a napkin with crayons. I wasn't that kid. <laughs> I ended up, I ended up going um, into marketing. I was in the corporate world, uh, but I was also a personal trainer for nine years. And wow. I don't think a lot of people know that about me. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was wonderful, and it was it was a wonderful job. You know, as I was a new newlywed, and it got me through my thirties. I was working part time for my husband, doing the marketing for his small business, and I got to do my you know my clients, and it was fun. It wasn't something that I particularly let's say would have done you know for years and years, but it was certainly enjoyable. And I I, lo- I do love people, and I love making those connections. So um, that is something that I don't think a lot of people know. I definitely didn't know that about you. It's not on your bio. It's not in your LinkedIn profile. Nine years is a long time, though, to do that. So I'm curious, when you think back on those nine years, um, are you, when you visualize the times that you were there, the gyms that you worked in, um, the people you worked with, is there one particular client that pops into your head, an image of that particular client? There was. There was a particular client. I don't know if I can use her real name, but um, we connect. Just a first name. No one will know. <laughs> her name was Sarah. <laughs> oh. Yep. Perfect. So we were the same age and um, she was sort of in a very religious community and she wasn't able to have a baby. 
And um, I, I was married, but I knew that I didn't want children. It was something that I just knew at a young age. It just wasn't necessary for me in this lifetime is how I describe it. And so I know that when she used to come we, we, to the, you know, tour for our appointments at the gym, I was sort of safe. She was outside of that religious community where everybody was having babies like crazy. And she was hanging out with me who was like, ah, oh, you know, who needs it? And so we connected. We really did. And uh, we built a friendship. I and mean, sometimes I still get text messages from her. She's really lovely. Oh, yeah. that is such a great story. So when you think about one particular interaction you had with her, where it seemed like she felt safe with you, um, what what was that? What you, she, you know, I, I didn't want to because <laughs> there was this when you first become a personal trainer. My one of my mentors, um, his name was Lenny. He said, you have to mind the line. You know, you can't start sort of psychoanalyzing your clients. You have to maintain that professional line. But I could see that she was getting angry uh, with her sister or or her, you know, her best friend who they were having babies like crazy. And I was like, she's getting angry at them, but because she feels bad about, um, you know, not being able to do that herself. So, um, like I, I was a support and I was a comfort for her, you know, and then we would talk about food and we would talk about entertaining and I would tell her what a pain in the neck my mother-in-law is. And so, you know, I, I brought some levity to the situation. So it was more than just a workout. It was, it was like a friendship. We really did develop a friendship and we've always left our sessions feeling good. You and I were just talking about certain people. Sometimes you feel drained by them. Sarah always left feeling like we were always revved up. Like we felt great from the interaction. So it was, it was quite special. I'm so glad you said that, that that's how it ended because I know so many times those conversations end up being a complaint fest and you leave feeling just as bad, if not worse, because you're sinking down into the mud together. But the idea that you both would, you'd probably talk about the difficulties, but then make light of it so that at the end, you're telling funny stories, you're making jokes about yourselves. And um, I could see how that would make the whole thing feel better. Absolutely. And it, it, you're right. And it's okay to complain. And it's okay to, you know, how we all have things that bother us and, and you know, weigh on us. But, but you don't want to stay there too long. And it's good to be with a friend that's like, okay, let's talk about how we can get out of this. Let's talk about the road ahead instead of just the misery. I and mean, we've all had people in our lives where we, we sit and we talk to them and, and it's, it's a drain listening to them because they just complain and everything's miserable, you know? So it's, it's, I think to me, important to build each other up. Um, and that was one of the things I loved about the personal training. I made those connections and now I'm, I'm of course able to do that in my writing I'm connected right. to the reader, which we'll get more into. So, yeah, I love that. And that is, it's so funny that, um, so many of us have these jobs in our past that could actually indicate what we were going to be like in our future, even if we couldn't know at that time. Oh, that's right. And the cast of characters, I've met so many different people. I mean, some people I would meet at the gym, but then there were women who wouldn't leave their house. So I would go and make a personal call to their homes. Um, In in fact, one one, uh, client of mine, her husband had an African gray parrot. And that African gray parrot made an appearance in The Sound of Wings as Malcolm. I got that idea from them, from from seeing their beautiful bird, because it was such a fascinating bird. So it's wonderful to have nine years at my back and be able to pull from all these different characters, if you will. Yes. Well, I just got to chill because as soon as you described this parrot, I was like, oh, my gosh, that's the same parrot that was in the book. Um, I think that's so important. Um, We talked briefly online about how our personal stories can be useful, so useful, even if we're writing fiction, and especially if we're writing fiction, because I think when we use those characters in those situations and awkward moments from our lives, it makes it more believable as a, as a fictional character, right? It sure does. Yeah, right. And we're, we're an imperfect people. You know, we have, we have scars, we have battle scars, and we have our own, you know, crazy situations. And, um, 
you know, it's wonderful to be able to throw that into my characters. There is a little piece of me in each of those characters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're all suffering from different things. A lot of it really is about their past. And, and a, a key theme in the book is silencing old ghosts. And I know you can totally relate to this because it's like you, the stories we tell ourselves, right? How we, our perception of things. And so it's silencing the noise and the things that we don't need anymore that we keep tripping over. And mm -hmm. that's a theme in the book. You know? Uh, you know, the other thing that really resonated with me is um, I have these theories about how we grow and develop as humans in terms of our relationships with ourselves and our relationships with others. And I feel like in our thirties is when we start to embrace those things about ourselves, or at least um, acknowledge and we kind of resign ourselves to certain aspects of who we are in our thirties, things that we were fighting all through our twenties. And then when we hit our thirties, we start to look at these things and go, okay, well, this is who I am. I just have to be resigned to this. But it seems that as we hit our later thirties and early forties, we start to embrace those things about ourselves that we thought were weird or that we, we didn't like as kids because it wasn't like everyone else. And now in our late thirties and early forties, we're like, well, of course, that's a good thing. This is what makes me a unique human. This is why I bring love and value to the people around me. But the thing that really resonated with me in the theme here was getting to that next stage of recognizing other women mm. and their value in our lives and choosing to surround ourselves with the right women, the mm. women who can help us quiet those inner voices, the, the ghosts. That is absolutely true. And I have done so much growing throughout my 30s. And now, as you know, I'm in my mid 40s. Um, and I, I don't know that I always place such value on having a network of women, but I sure do now. I mean, I'm meeting all these wonderful, fantastic authors. Meg is one, you, Sarah yourself, and uh, just how we, we, we connect and we bond and we build each other up. And I, I, it's invaluable. So absolutely, I put it into the story. And the other thing was, uh, if you, you remember, Goldie was older than Crystal and Jocelyn. Crystal's in her mid 40s and then Jocelyn's in her 30s. I didn't want them all to be the same age. I wanted them to be different ages and have different life circumstances going on to emphasize the point that we don't all have to be the same. We can be different and still find connections and bonds and help one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I definitely got that from the book. So tell me about um, you during our first phone call, you mentioned that you you were more in um, Crystal as a character. You saw more of yourself in Crystal, the character, than you did in the other two women. And part of that is, you know, she was in the same age range as where you are now. But tell me a little bit about why you resonated so much more with Crystal in terms of your personal story. I think because with Crystal and, and the whole, of course, the story was born from Crystal. As I was walking the shoreline, I got the image of Crystal who was decidedly different from me. She's buxom blonde. And, and, you know, so I, I wanted someone who wasn't me, but I, I recognize, I recognize myself in crystal because she is so capable and yet doesn't know it yet. And, you know, she has this wonderful husband, like I do, who is her biggest fan and her biggest supporter, but yet she sort of hasn't gotten to the point in her life where she's like, well, I can do this and I'm capable. And I think we all need to find that on our own. It's one thing to have your mom tell you and your husband or your best friends, but we all have, I think, that reckoning in our lives where we have to look in the mirror and say, I can do this, I'm capable and I'm, I'm worthy and I'm gonna, take, I'm gonna take the reins. And so I wanted to take Crystal on a journey and I have felt that way, I think, in my life. My husband's always been my biggest fan and I finally found myself through my fiction. Yeah. I was that kid who stared out the window and, and daydreamed and wasn't paying attention to what the teacher was saying and then had to ask, well, what, what's the tundra? I didn't, I wasn't paying attention in class. I'm so lucky to have this um, opportunity to be able to sit at my desk and daydream and put it into crafting stories. Right. So, yeah. So tell me about that moment. I mean, I know I have to backtrack a little bit. I don't believe in the light bulb watershed moments. 
What I do believe is that we're all on a dimmer switch. And those moments started long before we consciously recognize them. But there is always a moment when that dimmer switch comes on full bright. You're right. So I'm curious about yours when that self reflection hit, just like with Crystal, when she finally realized that's not about me, their behavior toward me isn't about me. That's right. But she had her moment um, when somebody else outside of her husband was like, you are extraordinary. So what was yours? Oh, okay. I think I had a couple of times and I love the way that you put that, Sarah, with the dimmer switch, because you're right. It's not like, oh, this, this happened this one time and everything changed. It's sometimes it's a series of things and it's a slow build. Uh, the first time I realized that I wanted to start writing was I was reading a lot of books and I had that little voice that we all have in our heads. If we're listening, it's there. And I couldn't believe how fantastic the book was. And, and it was like a symphony, the way the, the author um, crafted this story. And I went, wow, that was, that was fantastic. And I thought, I can do this. And that was the first turning of the dimmer. And then the uh, second time, once I started writing, I connected with my mentor, Caroline Levitt, who's a New York Times bestselling author. And uh, she's absolutely fantastic. Uh, she's, she's not just a wonderful writer, but she's a great literary citizen, as she says. And I sent her a few chapters and she said, you know, you're the real thing. You, you know, you could do this. This is great writing. And that was the life changing moment for me where I thought, oh, I oh, wow, this is wonderful. And of course, Crystal has that in the story as well, where she sees someone selling these crafts and thinks, I can do that too. And then Goldie comes along and confirms it for her and ends up, of course, giving her the, the business venture. And, and she's in the store now selling her goods, which was not something she was expecting, but it was exactly what she needed. Exactly. Yeah, I knew there was a moment and again, got another chill thinking about you um, emulating your experience in Crystal's experience of having the inner voice first, because it has to start there. Somebody externally can't tell you something you're awesome at until you've at least had some evidence that you could or you can or you did. That's absolutely true. Yeah, there's the belief in yourself. It's not an easy, it's a hard win to come by, isn't it? Isn't it? Is. It? <laughs> it is. It and, is. And, and then there's always the question, why do I need somebody externally to tell me? And, yes. and then, you know, you're punishing yourself for that. Like how, how much can we punish ourselves? <laughs> really? Right. And I think too, with age, I, I've learned to become more gentle with myself in so many ways. And, and I love your theme of the stories that we tell ourselves and the things that I think, uh, you know, I'm just like, no, don't stop being so down on Suzanne. <laughs> right. Because we we really can be our own worst critics and our harshest enemies, can't we? Yeah. And it, it's, it's interesting. My sister and I just had this conversation a um, couple days ago in the morning where we're, we, we talk a lot. And she said, uh, we we had this conversation about our internal dialogue. So after an event, after a conversation, an interaction, we're walking away. And for the next two days, there's a whole internal dialogue. What did I say wrong? Um, you know, did I insult them when I said this? And what if I did this and I didn't mean to, and I hope I didn't hurt her feelings or, you know, like this constant um, my sister described it as, as self-loathing, but I, I don't see it that way because I don't, I don't hate myself. I love myself, especially at 51. I'm at this place where I'm like, I can keep learning for sure. And I still mess up and it's really frustrating, but I love the journey I'm on. And, and so um, for me, it's more a matter of being able to look at the evidence that I didn't totally mess that up. And so my sister and I agreed that from now on, as we start down that awful self-berating internal dialogue, the judgment against ourselves, that we are both going to stop and think about what we did right. What, where's the evidence that we did something right? And one thing is, she said, well, they invited us back on Friday. 
So I'm like, well, this, this friend of yours wouldn't have invited you back if they didn't enjoy your company. That's right. But we well, we do do that. We question ourselves, and I shouldn't have said this, and and I'll do it from something that happened 35 years ago. I'm sure you're the same. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I'm like, okay, but Suzanne, that was 30 years ago. Are we really gonna? You're really. It's in, and then when if you're anything like me, sometimes if you hear a song. It, for some reason, like four days later, all of a sudden you're singing the song because it's left an impression in your brain. And so you have to remember those kinds of things because, you know, it, it's like you have a bad interaction with someone and then you're like, oh, I don't feel good. Why don't I feel good days later? And you're because that's still flying around your head or mm -hmm. you're still down on yourself or thinking about it and hasn't left. So it's like we have to make our peace with things. Right. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. So how do you do that? I told you my strategy, the way my sister and I were talking about it. What's what's your strategy for that? Well, I do yoga and I, I do meditate. Uh, and the writing does help. You know, they say that if you're angry with someone, write it down and never send the letter, but write it all out. It does help to type that out. Whatever script is going on in my mind, I get it all out. And then I'm like, okay, I can be done with this. I can put it in a file and I just released you know, so that's one way. Yeah. And the yoga does help because you're so focused on different, I don't know if you've ever done yoga, but you're so oh, yes. focused on different positions. It's challenging. Um, so that, that I love, I love yeah. it because I think it's if, my body, soul, it's mind, body, soul. Right. And I think when you're doing it right, you become so present, so mindful of that moment where your body is, how you're breathing, even to the, the extent of what are my feet touching? Um, do I feel that in my elbow? <laughs> All those conscious efforts to be really present and mindful. I think that's probably part of what really helps when you're doing yoga. Absolutely. And my yogi, her name is Leah. She's wonderful. It, she'll put us in these positions that are particularly challenging. And I'm like, okay, I'm thinking, okay, we're going to stay here for three seconds and then we're going to be done. Right. But she's like, now I want you to feel the challenge of it. And, she, you know, she, she's like, get out of your mind. I know this isn't easy and you have no idea how long I'm going to keep you in this position. And you're shaking, you know, it's, <laughs> really, it's so interesting because it's all, it, it, I see what she's doing there. It's not about the physical as much as it is about the mind. Absolutely. You're challenging yourself. And I find like, um, I hike a lot on the mountain behind my house. And the thing that allows me to have that presence of mind. I, I don't do a lot of yoga anymore. I did years back, but um, when I'm hiking on the mountain, I have to go really steep at the beginning of the hike so that my heart rate goes up and I'm, you know, breathing really hard. Doesn't matter how many times I do it, it still is hard and it's harder every year as I get older. But I, I, it, I have to do that first because about eight to 10 minutes into it, that's when it suddenly the, the clouds break apart and inspiration starts to hit and I start to feel much more present, but uh, I don't know. That's what I could immediately relate to when you're talking about holding a position. I read that in your book, I read that about the height. I love that. And I can relate to it. I can relate to it, of course, because of the training and, and that used to be my happy pill. It was like, you know, I was depressed or down or whatever. And the weights would actually, you know, the, the, the sweating, the, like you're saying, the exertion, it, it makes you feel good. And, and I love the way you describe the parting of the clouds. It's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. It's like a clearing of the mind. It and is. That's what we need to get to, right? In order for the good stuff to, to come through. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Melissa Hughes talks a lot about that and the endorphins that are released when you get your heart rate up and you're working physically. Yeah. Absolutely. Good for your brain. <laughs> Good for your brain. It's funny too. I, I didn't know I was going to talk so much about the training, but I'm thinking about when I would have clients come in and I, I'm very perceptive because I love people and I'm just in tuned. I'm an empath. And I would always know if they were having an off morning, like what's going on? Hey, Jan, what's going on? Nothing. I'm fine. And I'm like, mm. and then as we would go through the workout and they would start exerting a little bit, I would hear what was going on. My husband upset me or I got had a fight with my daughter or, you know, and it was interesting that once they started working out, then they were more forthcoming as <laughs> it was going on. And just like you said, the parting of the clouds. And now they're like, okay, I'll tell you what's happening. But I knew, I, I always knew, I was so in tune 
when they would walk in the gym. Yeah. Oh, that's what made you a great trainer. That's why they kept coming back. It's like the, the best bartenders, but actually a healthy habit. <laughs> I love that you compared. Yep, that's right. And one of my friends who was a trainer was both. He was a bartender and a personal trainer. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> I can't even imagine having to listen to people's problems all day. Jobs. <laughs> it's funny. Oh, I love it. Yeah. That's so funny. So tell me another story about um, how you, I, I love the story about Caroline Le- Levitt. Is that who it was? Yep. Caroline Levitt. Yep. That external, this is actually really good. Tell me about afterward. Because I know that it's not like that sinks in right away. I know we share a similar way of processing things that we experience where we can we immediately respond, but then you and I both take a few days afterward of tossing that around in our heads. And so what happened after that conversation? So after that, I went, um, I was trying to pitch a manuscript and then we had bought here in Cape May 2015 and the sound of wings was, was whispering to me. So I started writing that book, but it wouldn't be until another two years later that I would land a literary agent. And I think that was a big win in my life. It was like, Ooh, okay. I'm somebody I landed a literary agent, which is a very hard thing to do. But then what they don't tell you, they tell you that the journey's going to be, you know, hard. And it is with, with writing. But I didn't know that landing a literary agent wasn't the end all be all because it took a whole nother year for me to learn that she couldn't sell the manuscript. And we parted ways amicably, of course. Um, So it was it so it was like these little wins along the way, like like landing the agent and uh, uh, hearing from friends and then getting blurbs and then finally getting my contract with my publisher, which is She Writes Press in the summer of 2019. Uh, and then it's it's really something to have a book out in the world. I'm sure you can relate to this because now you're hearing from readers, people who are not my friends, people who are not my mentors, strangers, and they are loving the book. And it's just like I, I could cry with some of these reviews. So so there's a lot of up and down. It's 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 a roller coaster. You know, it is. So tell me about one of those reviews from a stranger that still gives you chills and makes your eyes well up. Well, there was one woman that said, if you love women's fiction and books that you, you know, you don't want to ever see end, pick this book up, which really touched me. Uh, My neighbor, Joe and I, my husband, Joe and I were out on our deck and my neighbor called out to me yet last week. She said, come on down. I have to talk to you. And she, her daughter is um, a, a lit student. And she said, my daughter just called me. She's crying. She finished the book. She loved it. It was like, oh my God, it's just overwhelming. So yes, overwhelmed is exactly the right word because when you understand and you are told that you've elicited this emotional response from your reader, which is exactly why you write a book like this, it's overwhelming to actually have that external uh, gratification to hear it, right? It is. And it, and it's a way in which I'm connecting with people. Again, how important that is to me in, in the course of my lifetime to make those connections and to be able to affect someone. You know, when I'm writing my book, Sarah, uh, the, the room that I'm sitting in fades away from me and I am in the story and the characters come to life. They're as real to me as my next door neighbors. And that is what I want to provide for the reader is an escape from life. I want the, when they open my book and they open my story to just let everything else fade into the background. Mm-hmm. Well, and it is an escape. And at the same time, the characters resonate with people. So yeah, it's an escape. But at the same time, I can say, I see so much of myself in this character or that character. That's right. And another thing that I had heard once from another reader that she said that the characters haven't left me. And that means everything to me uh, because these are my babies. You know, they're, they are, they're my children. They are my creation and they've come to life for me. So to be able to make them real for other people is, I feel absolute nothing but gratitude to be able to do such a thing. Mm-hmm. I hear that. 
<laughs> loud and clear. As a creator yourself and an artist and a singer, I'm sure you can understand what it's like to, to move people like that, right? I do. As a matter of fact, I just told this story to a friend that one of our first big performances is at a, a fundraiser for a, a big nonprofit here in, in Helena, Montana. And it was just our small trio. And we had just performed Dream a Little Dream, the Cass Elliott, Mama Cass um, song. And my friend had provided these beautiful harmonies and I did the melody on Dream a Little Dream. And I'll never forget walking off the stage afterward for a break. And I had seen a woman probably in her mid to late seventies um, dabbing at her eyes while I was singing. Mm -hmm. And I came down to her table and I said, um, I noticed you were dabbing at your eyes when I sang Dream a Little Dream. Um, thank you for, for obviously feeling the sentiment that I was trying to express. And she gently put her hand on my arm and another tear started dribbling. She said, mm -hmm. that was my mother's favorite song. Oh gosh. And see, you, you gave her that beautiful sign for her mother to, mm -hmm. to be able to have that connection. How wonderful that must've been for you. Mm -hmm. Were you able to walk I, away I, without crying? I would have been crying. No, oh, no, my eyes definitely filled up. And I'm not much of a crier, but man, having her so gently touch me, that that affection and the, the deep emotion in her voice, how could you not tear up with something like that? No, and, impossible. <laughs> right. Like you hearing from your neighbor that her daughter oh. was crying as a result of the, the end of your book. <laughs> Right. And she's a young woman. She's in her 20s. And I was like, wow, I really affected someone. But it means so much. It's such a validation is another word, isn't it? It's such a validation. Oh, yeah. So tell me, when you think about this woman in her 20s yeah. who understood, who understood the book enough to, to be emotionally touched by it, mm. where do you think her lessons are in it? Because for me, it's it's a lesson of familiarity and comfort in knowing that they're that I'm in great company in terms of the characters. Um, but for her, what do you think is her aha moment or, or, you know, without actually knowing and being able to ask her, what would you want her to get out of it? I think that we're not alone. You know, sometimes I think this life and this ride can feel quite lonely. And I think it's a good reminder that we're not, that w there are people we meet and, and they could be family, but they could also just be wonderful friends that are assist us on the journey, which has been, you know, a theme in my own life. And that's why it's so present in the story. So I think when you touch a reader that way and they walk away thinking that, you know, that they're brought to tears, they, they feel touched and they feel like I understood something about her and she's not alone, if you will. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I like that. And it's such an important lesson for all of us that we can create family if we don't have family. I think it's, yeah. I think it's quite important. I think just, just as there are toxic people out there, they could, they could certainly be residing in our own families. And so I'm a big proponent of eliminating any toxicity in, in our lives to, to create more for the good. So, so yeah, I, I have friends that do feel like family to me. And, and to clarify that toxicity is not the same thing as somebody who um, is having a hard time or isn't always positive. Toxicity is somebody who is abusive, somebody who cannot see anything outside of themselves. That is a very um, important distinction. Absolutely. That's correct. Right. Or, or we'll go back to your story. I read your book and I loved it. And so you. that, that friend that you quote unquote friend that you had who said that you weren't pretty, that's a toxic person. That's a, that's a horrible thing to say to somebody and think about how that lasted with you. And so that, those are the types of people I'm talking about that person, that person mm -hmm. in your life. Is the things yeah. that we're doing. talk I mean, about life lessons, <laughs> and that well, was only seventh grade, right? Seventh grade. It's the worst. It's the most. <laughs> time. I mean, I know this. I I am fine with getting older. I could never be a teenager again. I don't know how how these kids do it. It's hard. And to be thirteen years old and have someone, one of your peers, say that to you, uh, of course you you responded the way you did, and, and that stuck with you for all these years. It would anybody. I don't. 
just like it did with Crystal. The girls were so mean to her in school. It is. Yeah. And I, I think the next important aspect of that that you touch on in the book is um, being able to share that experience with others, but in a way that demonstrates you've learned and grown as a result of it, as opposed to sharing those stories in a way that makes you feel like a victim. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that you said that. Absolutely. There's a sense of empowerment there. And, you know, we do see that by the end of the story because Crystal has gone through a journey and I'm working on my next book and Crystal's not, she's not going to be a main character. She's a secondary character and it's set 12 years later, but my gosh, you're going to see how much she's grown and just where she's taken this journey and and her businesses. It's just, it was, it's been wonderful to write. Oh, that's awesome that you get to see your characters grow into the next production. And part of what I love about that, Suzanne, is that I love reading books that are unrelated to each other, but that share characters. So um, Carl Hyacin is like the the king at doing that, at bringing characters into books, even though you can read any of the books as standalones. That is absolutely accurate. And that that's Right. I've told people it's not a sequel because they are, oh, are you going to write a sequel? No, it's not a sequel. You can certainly read, like you said, as standalones. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you this. When I threw Jocelyn and Crystal into this new manuscript that I'm working on, this story came to life. And it, I think it was, Sarah, because I missed them. I <laughs> loved them. I created them. I missed them. So throwing them back in and then th- putting Jocelyn in with Billy, who's now a teenager, was like, oh, this is great. What a great idea I had. <laughs> oh, I love that. It's like a reunion for you. <laughs> right. That's right. I wasn't expecting that. So it's fun. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Well, let's go full circle. Okay. You talk about the fact that you you really like people and, and I'm I'm the same. I don't consider myself a super sentimental or touchy-feely person, but I really like people. I'm very curious about all their stories. When you think back, when you um, first completed your first manuscript, and I know it never feels complete, so I'm not pretending like you finished and went, whoo, that's done. (laughs) But when you did, and you knew that it was ready for that first review as a complete manuscript, what did you do? And and what, what were you thinking in that moment? When I finished the book, I cried, and then I took a shower. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I walked around in a stupor like just kind of pacing because I do that when I have when I have frenetic energy I pace um and it felt almost like I was numb and I sent the book to Caroline and I said okay I finished it here it is you know here I completed the story and I sent it off to my mentor uh but it it my gosh typing the end is quite something. It, it, it is quite something. And, uh, and believe me, there were edits. She sent of the bench back to me and oh, there were edits. Oh my gosh. How many times I've read this book. I can't even tell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have a book, you understand what this is like. So, yes. Well, unfortunately not enough authors go through that really rigorous editing process. I, I think we would have far more solid literature out there if people actually really were were far more rigorous in their editing. And I think really the key to is have another set of eyes on it and not a friend that's going to tell you, wow, you're fabulous. Everything's perfect in the book because Caroline first gave me that manuscript back. She had a lot of edits and it took me four months, Sarah, to go through those edits and change it. Yeah, you know, I don't have to tell you how hard it is and how much work is involved with, with a book, but so well, and separating yeah. yourself from the edits, like this is not because I'm a bad writer. <laughs> this is not because there it's a bad story. As a matter of fact, Caroline wouldn't have bothered with all of that because it took her four hours at least, probably a lot more, right. um, to edit to that extent because she cared so deeply for the book. Correct. And she wasn't editing my grammar, to be clear. She was working on the story arc story. and character development and plot points and being sure everything was up to, to snuff, if you will. Yeah. And um, so she made the, the book a lot stronger. You know, she did. 
You did. So that's you did. that's why you hire a professional <laughs> to do your rigorous editing. That is my advice to writers out there. You need a pro. You need a pro. Yep. 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 Oh, what wonderful stories, Suzanne. I so much fun. <laughs> I so appreciate you taking the time to visit with me and to um, answer my kind of deep and probing questions. <laughs> this was wonderful. I, I feel like I've been talking to you for years. This is so great. Thank you. It does feel that way. Well, I really appreciate it. And for our listeners, um, I will have links to her book and to get in touch with her um, on the blog post associated with the podcast. So, um, but, so you don't have to run off and grab a pen to write this down. But Suzanne, what are the best ways for people to reach you, to get to your book, to be on the list, to find out when your next book is published? Sure, absolutely. The best way would be my website, which is simply www.suzannesimonetti.com. That's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-S-I-M-O-N-E-T-T-I. Perfect. Perfect. And are you on LinkedIn? Is that a good place to connect with you as well? I am on LinkedIn. I, I got to spend a little bit more time on there. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. I have an author page. I, I do pop in on LinkedIn. So yes, you can find me there as well. Absolutely. Okay. I think a lot of my listeners are there, but I will also include links for your Instagram and Facebook because that's probably where the majority of your activity is. Fantastic. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. This has been wonderful. Are you ready to start your story portfolio so you have the right story ready to share when the opportunity presents itself? When you're ready to get started, my book, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, is available in all the regular places, and the audiobook version is available on Google Play and on my website, elkinsconsulting.com. As a special bonus for listeners, the audiobook includes two songs recorded by my band, Spare Change in my living room in Montana. Also on my website is a free podcast interview checklist. It's available to download to make sure you make the most out of your next podcast interview. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to rate the podcast and leave a review and let me know that you've done it so I can thank you properly. Thank you. <laughs>